do the private client services here in Las Vegas. I am their sales and risk consultant for Nevada. And uh, it's really my pleasure to be here tonight. Uh, if anyone purchases an item, that's what we specialize in, ensuring those special items. So uh, anyway, thanks again for allowing me to be a part of, and Marsh being a part of this event tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Sheree. Appreciate it. As I said before, we're, we're here to celebrate creation, what the heights of man can do. And I think what you see through some of this artwork uh, represented here is the ability not only for us to be human, but us for to be better than, than what we thought we could be. And I'd like to introduce a very dear friend of mine right now, a gentleman by the name of Rod Malley, who's the CEO of Art Encounter. And he's the gentleman that was so kind to bring a lot of this event together and to bring these wonderful, beautiful pieces of art here. So, Rod. Thank you, Tony. I work better from behind here. Uh, my name is Rod Maley, and our company is Art Encounter. We've been around for 25 years, and uh, we perform basically three services to the uh, art public. And first and foremost, we buy and sell art, and we primarily specialize in investment grade, high-end artwork, however we do do decorative works as well. In addition, we do consulting to private collectors and institutions about their collections, and we also do appraisal services as well. And our, the third aspect of our business is we do museum and conservation picture framing for those clients that want to frame their works. Um, you're going to hear a lot about what we do tonight. Welcome to Evening with the Masters. You're going to meet the brains of the, the operation at Art Encounter, and it's not me. It's uh, the people you'll be meeting here in just a little bit. And first and foremost is my son, Brett. Brett is probably the best-known art appraiser in the world right now, and primarily because he's been on over 50 episodes of the History Channel's number one program for the last five or six years, and that's Pawn Stars here in Las Vegas. And uh, as a matter of fact, he's going to be on some show. What is that called this weekend? It's going to be a very art-oriented show called Deadly Possessions. Deadly Possessions. And it's on the Travel Channel. And Brett is going to go and look at a cursed painting of the crying boy. Okay? So it should be kind of fun. It's going to be on Saturday and Sunday night. Check your, check your local times for that. And uh, so it should be fun. Tonight we're going to give you some insight on what it is takes to basically uh, substantiate value in paintings, the work that goes through paintings and other artwork, sculptures as well. And uh, I think you're, you're going to get a better appreciation after this evening's program of what goes into art, art investing, art collecting, and just a better appreciation for what we do. Uh, back to Brett. He graduated from uh, UNLV. He came here with us 25 years ago and uh, has been working in the business ever since. He did his graduate work at UC Irvine. He is a uh, certified appraiser and has appraised some of the best works in the, uh, in the country from some of the top people, top collectors. One piece that we're doing in eight days, you will see a piece uh, that is auctioning by Norman Rockwell, and our client is Jerry Lewis, the entertainer here in Las Vegas. Uh, we've we represent that piece. We're taking it to auction. It's going to be auctioned in Dallas, Texas. We expect it to go for about a half a million dollars. Uh, so we're excited about those kinds of opportunities. But without further ado, I'd like to introduce Brett, who will give you a really good oversight on uh, what the current conditions of the art market are. So without Brett, come on up. Good evening, everybody. It's actually a good thing you're seeing me today because my reputation might not be as secure come Monday after this deadly possessions thing. So, <laughs> it's, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to, uh, to meet a lot of you. I had a real nice time visiting with a lot of you for the first time during our cocktail reception. And it's exciting to meet a lot of people who are already uh, so enthused about art, who have a passion for art. Many are already art collectors. 
in my line of work, I meet a lot of people, particularly my age and younger, who just don't have that passion for art or the affinity for art, and that's a shame. A lot of people my age, they look at uh, investing in art just strictly from a, a commodity standpoint. And we all know that's not the case. When you're talking about investing in art, you're talking about investing in culture. You're talking about investing in history. You're talking about investing in your own uh, personal interest. And that's, that's uh, important to delineate. That being said, I have to say, in spite of that, and maybe even because of it, there has never been a better time to jump into the market as an art investor or a collector as right now. And I, I mean that in all sincerity. I don't say that lightly. There are conditions in today's art market that make it perfect for a burgeoning art collector. Now, part of the reason for that, there's a couple of reasons, but there's actually a multitude of reasons, but the big ones uh, are globalization and transparency within the market. That's something that, quite frankly, wasn't here 25 years ago. 25 years ago, if you were a collector looking to buy uh, an esteemed artwork by a prestigious artist, you were pretty much beholden to Sotheby's or to Christie's or maybe a small handful of galleries. And if there was a recession or if trends changed, for example, in New York or London or Paris, it was a virtual guarantee your art was going to take a serious hit in terms of its value. 25 years ago, the market was rife with impropriety. Uh, to give you an idea, I don't know if we have any Dolly collectors here, but between 19, the 1970s and 1980s, nearly 70% of all Dolly graphic works that were sold were fakes, nearly 70%. Art was this kind of secret universe where, you know, there were market professionals that could do business, but if you were an outsider, you were either uh, shunned or scammed or at the very least taken advantage of in terms of price gouging and things like that. Fortunately, that's really not the case today. Uh, the market has changed dramatically. Uh, nowadays, thanks to globalization, you've got art galleries, you've got art collectors, you've got art uh, auction houses, connoisseurs that can connect on a global scale. We also now have the ability to really analyze and scrutinize and even predict the art market for different countries around the world. And that's quite exciting. Um, now, what have we learned because of that? Why is this new climate such a boon to art investors like us? I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to try to answer that question, but before I do, I want to introduce you, introduce you to a term that's very important in today's art climate. It's something you'll be hearing quite a bit tonight from the other people that get up to, to speak, but it's a term called provenance. And as many of you probably know, provenance is the history of something. And in art circles, basically what that applies to is the, the history of a painting or a sculpture, its origins its exhibition history, its collectors, things like that. It can also apply to a specific artist. Uh, what's the provenance of a specific artist? What is their acumen? What is their exhibition his history, et cetera, et cetera. And the reason I mention provenance is because it's been pretty much proven in the last 10 years or so that there are certain artists and artworks with esteemed provenance that are virtually recession proof, which is amazing. If you look at certain, my father likes to use a term called uh, Art 101 artist, the artist that everybody's heard of, uh, the Andy Warhols, the Marc Chagalls, the Henry Matisses, the Jean-Michel Basquiat's of the world. The market for those artists has never been better. It's thriving. And opposed to that, you look at artists that are middle tier artists or emerging artists or regional artists, and their market is stagnant at best. It has not recovered from the recession. It's still trying to reach levels that it was at 10, 15 years ago. Again, it comes back to provenance. I'll give you an example. During the last recession, when galleries were closing, we were all having issues. Auction houses, their business was contracting in New York and in London and in Paris. Other countries of the world stepped up to the forefront. China, for example, for about a four-year period after the recession became one of the largest collectors 
of contemporary art. And who were they collecting? As, as regional and you know, uh, isolated and as nationalistic as we think of China as being, the artists they were collecting were uh, Basquiat. They were collecting Jeff Koons. They were collecting Andy Warhol. They were collecting Western artists with a global provenance. And it wasn't just contemporary artists they were collecting. Uh, just last year, a major Chinese developer purchased uh, Claude Monet, an impressionist piece, for over $20 million. So that gives you an idea of the globalization and how provenance affects collecting art in today's economy. Something else that happened during the recession that's also very important is it curtailed what we call the speculative art market. And the speculative art market is a little like investing in penny stocks. You know, you hope to, to get in on the ground floor with an artist on their way up. You want to buy their works when they're low, and then hopefully, as they become household names, their value will double, triple, quadruple, etc. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. But the problem is, before the recession hit, circa 2006, 2007, the values often exceeded merit. And that's when you get into a problem. Uh, I have a, a buddy who collects baseball cards. And just I was talking with him just the other day, and he said, uh, the speculative market in baseball cards is ridiculous. If, you, if there's a hot rookie out there who hasn't taken a single swing in the major leagues, a lot of times their cards are selling for two, three, four times the amount of uh, a perennial all-star. And when that happens, there's something wrong in the market. And that's what was happening in 2007, 2008. My father, <laughs> he often says, if you put enough dynamite under a rock, it becomes a rocket. And that was what was happening in the art market before the recession. Uh, an artist, to give you an example, one of our executive director, Scott Ferguson's favorite artist, uh, Damien Hurst. Apologies to any Damien Hurst fans. But uh, his market was more hype than history. Uh, in 2007, for a brief period, he was the most expensive living artist. And in two years after the recession hit, he wasn't even at the top 100. So that's something you have to consider as a prospective investor in the art market. And that's something that fortunately has kind of been rectified in recent years. A final indicator of provenance and its importance within today's market is since 2000, more museums have been established worldwide than in the entirety of the 19th and 20th centuries combined. Just think about that. Over 700 new museums each year are being opened. And what works are they looking for, these museums? They're looking for esteemed artists, and they're looking for works with esteemed provenance. So something to consider as an art investor. Now, one final word about provenance. In addition to enhancing value, it's something that as a burgeoning collector, which I hope you'll become, it's something that enhances your enjoyment of fine art. We've sold a lot of works. Uh, for example, we, we recently sold a, a Thomas Moran, a Hudson River piece. Uh, the collectors are in the room today. And it was a gorgeous work. It was really quite stunning, even on first blush. But once you learn the provenance that it was done in the 1860s prior to any sort of air traffic or water traffic other than the possible you know, floating canoe, uh, it was done in plain air, uh, which was you know, par for the course with Thomas Moran's work. He did it there right on the shoreline with moving shadows and fighting weather conditions and you know, changing in, uh, the movement of the subjects matter that he was trying to, to capture long before photography, long before he could take a photo and go back to his studio and, and do the work back then. Once you realize those things, it enhances your enjoyment uh, and your appreciation of the work. And with that being said, I want to introduce our executive director, uh, who is going to explain a lot of the important provenance of the works you see here today. I'm sure you've looked around. You see artists whose names you recognize. You may even see works that you like and appreciate. But again, I think once you learn the provenance, the history, I think it'll enhance your appreciation that much more. So I'm going to introduce our executive director, Scott Ferguson, very smart, savvy guy. He's got an incredible art acumen. He's got some great stories, too. Hopefully, he'll tell us one or two of them. Mr. Scott Ferguson. Thanks, buddy. 
All right, so I have a slideshow, and I'm not really great at this, but uh, we'll see what we do here. Hey, okay. So here's a work of art that uh, uh, at first look is um, uh, 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 very much um, crude, rude, um, in your face, and that was the artist that he was. This is a work of art by Jean-Michel Basquiat, a New York City graffiti artist from the 1980s who was never expected to do much in his life, yet he was Mensa smart, spoke four languages by the time he was 20 years old. People don't know that about him. He came from a very good sound background, but chose to leave home and become a graffiti artist on the streets of New York. He wasn't really a graffiti artist, he was more of a graffiti poet. Um, he spoke about life in New York City in the 1970s as a young black artist. I challenge anybody in the room to name two black artists. Very difficult to do. OK. He broke that mold. So Jean-Michel Basquiat became the third highest selling artist in the history of the world. He's considered the most influential artist in the second half of the 19th century. He's really important as, as, uh, as to what we understand art to be as, as contemporary art. And uh, in the 1940s, Picasso was contemporary. In the 1950s, Matisse was contemporary. In the 1960s, Warhol was contemporary. In the 80s, this was the guy. And uh, he was very uh, generously misunderstood originally, but very quickly attained uh, stratospheric uh, uh, recognition. Here's a work of art that we all recognize, Pablo Picasso. This work of art was from 1968. It was at the end of his life. Toward the end of Picasso's life, he was considered a degenerate, uh, someone that was uh, overreaching someone that was just uh, doing sexual works of art because he had uh, reached his peak back in the uh, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, but uh, in 1968, this was what he was doing. He was actually experimenting with work. It was Picasso who said it took his entire career to learn to paint like a child. Now, most of them were sexually explicit. That's true but um, it didn't lessen his importance as an artist. And now, after his death in 1973, by 1975, they were holding important exhibitions worldwide over the latter works of his life. Not the early works, they were already recognized. It was the latter works that were suddenly getting recognized as being highly important in his career. And here it is beautifully framed by Art Encounters esteemed frame department. Henri Matisse, he was a contemporary Picasso. This is a work of art that is an example of an exercise of an artist. An athlete wakes up, he does some push-ups, he might run on the treadmill, he gets his body going, so does an artist. So what you're seeing here is a depiction of an artist in his living room, that's his wife in the lower left corner, sitting there knitting. Uh, the statues that you see, the woman in the window, the man leaning against the fireplace on the left, they were actually only 10 inches tall in that room. What he was doing was exercising perspective, texture, and drama. And he did it very well in a very simple line drawing. These are completely unavailable in the art world today. They are all in museums or in private collections. Art Encounter has a few of these works available for offer. We seek these out for our collectors. What we do is acquire them at the right price so that our investors, our collectors, are well ahead of the investment before they ever acquire the work of art. And it's really important to us to make that happen for the investment group that seeks that out. So not only do you acquire a, an Henri Matisse, beautifully framed, 
but you're, you're, you're creating a legacy. You're creating a legacy for your family, for your collection. So uh, what you need to seek out as an investor is someone who can prove the history of the work of art, that it has uh, um, shown its merit, that it is the best the artist had to offer, that it's available in the first place, and most importantly, is that it's presented to you correctly at a real, honest price. You need to go to, uh, you need to feel comfortable with whom you do business. It's highly, highly important. Uh, this is one of the rare works of art that would otherwise be in a museum. Here's another work of art. This is a Matisse. At the end of his life, the last, five the last five years of his life, he was bound to a wheelchair. He seemingly randomly would cut out works of paper. The, the taupe that you see would be cut out with a giant pair of shears that he would use and just cut out pieces of paper and allow them to flutter to the floor. He would then tell an assistant where to place them on the work. So they weren't pre-traced, they weren't pre-thought, he would do this apparently randomly. Yet, here's a woman sitting in a river. That's why you don't see her feet. They're submerged below the water. And the water's coming around her, her body. And she's got her hair up. So she's bathing in a river, which would happen in France. You know, it, it's a kind of a normal op occupation. And the two things depicted also are frogs. Yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> You try and cut out a frog out of a piece of paper. <laughs> so. And there it is again, beautifully framed. This is one of the rarest works of art that we've ever had in our gallery. It is by far not the most expensive. It's the rarest. In Andy Warhol's young career, he was known as an illustrator. 99% of his illustrations were thrown away. So if he did something for the New York Times, if he did something for Henri Bendel, if he did something for, you know, for a, for a, a record album company, uh, the artwork was used and then tossed out. They do not exist today. It's incredibly rare to find one. I'll tell you the story on this. He was invited to come to RCA Records to do a al album cover. People don't know this about Warhol. But as an illustrator, he did over 300 album covers. There's a, a, an entire uh, catalog resume of his works. Uh, people know the Rolling Stones' Sticky Fingers album as being his and a couple of others. But he did over 300 albums, Tennessee Williams and uh, uh, the jazz records. And so here's one for Kenny Burrell. He took a photograph of Kenny Burrell. He went back to his studio, and he drew this drawing. He presented two works of art to uh, RCA Records. They chose one, used it, and he walked out, the, out of the building with this one. He met up with his niece that day and gave this to her as a gift. This was pinned to her wall from the time she was 15 until the time Art Encounter acquired it. So this comes directly, speaking of provenance and history, it comes directly from the niece of the artist. There's no question of its authenticity. That's the album. That this is the drawing that was used. The other was the drawing that we have. Very, very rare. Also, 1956, you'll notice, was the first year that Andy Warhol ever started signing his illustrations. So it's you know a, a, a really a, a, a double your money work of art. Lastly, I wanted to talk about Juan Miro. This guy would fit in with today's politici politicians so well. He was an outsider. He refused to bow to the bourgeois. He refused to bow to who was supplying artists with money at the time. And it nearly cost him his life and his career. So at the time that he was doing these kind of drawings, well, this one's from the 1970s. But in the turn of the century, he was coloring outside of the lines. The only people hiring artists then were the Catholic Church, the bourgeois, and royalty. If you could not get them to support you and be your patron, 
You were not an artist, and you did not survive. Your father made you become a banker, a clerk, a stockholder, something like that, something where you would have to apprentice for 20 years before you got your job. He refused to do so. He was the first one of his kind to ever do this kind of abstraction and stick to it. It was completely unacceptable by anybody in the art world, and he was considered an outsider. Well, he stuck with it, he stuck to his guns, and he turned out to be one of the most important artists in the history of the world. Uh, so here's a very beautiful mural, and this is another work of art that we have available. Okay, so I think we're gonna end there uh, on, on the artworks. But, but here's the thing that Art Encounter provides, uh, most importantly. We seek out work of art that will not only attain uh, value in the future, but be really important to your collection. We work with you as a collector, as an investor, and we seek out works of art that mean something to you, that leave a legacy behind as to who you are as a person. And they speak to your children, to your grandchildren, to the future, as to what you chose to collect. You didn't just choose something because it was investment worthy. You chose something because it meant something to you. I recommend to every client that we ever sell a work of art to, write a letter and attach it to the back of the work of art. So that if this isn't something that you sell down the road, that you have a letter on there that your children know that I was still in love the day I bought this. My husband and I chose this together. We really believed in what we were doing. We enjoy this every day of our lives, and now we pass this along to you. So whether it goes to auction or it goes to your future children and your grandchildren, it's something that speaks about you as a person. And that's the most important thing about investing in works of art. Know who you're getting it from. Know the history or provenance of the work of art itself, and let it be proved to you and receive a certificate of authenticity stating so, and let it be something that you love. Thank you. Okay. So I'd like to bring up Rod Maley. All right. With it, like any other investment, whether you buy real estate, you invest in a business or whatever, is we're realizing its full potential. We're doing everything. So to take a masterwork like a Leonardo piece from a private collection that nobody knows about, never heard of, never seen, to a public piece that's going to be shown in galleries, and basically it's getting ready to do a world tour, uh, that's part of our plan. And so just recently, Jim and his wife, Ann, went, represented us in Italy, and he's got some exciting news about how we're building the value on the Leonardo and how we're going to be presenting it to the world. And uh, with that, I would like to introduce Jim Petty, who is my partner and is absolutely a genius on the Leonardo and has been working with some unbelievable contacts in Italy, so we're going back to where Leonardo started, we're going back to Italy, and that's where we're gonna begin the world tour of this incredible artwork that's in Las Vegas. So with that, Mr. Petty. Thank you, Rod. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody for, had my thanks for everybody coming out tonight to uh, an evening with the masters. And one thing I was remiss, basically, the slide that we had at the first part, we talked about the, our hosts and the sponsors, and I was remiss in not having Marsh on there, so I want to thank Marsh personally for helping uh, sponsor this uh, event tonight. So thank you for them, and I'm sorry I left your logo off my slide. I'm not good at this uh, stuff. I put this together. I'm the audiovisual expert here tonight, and uh, that's saying not much. All right. <clears throat> 
We produced the short film you have just viewed in an attempt to condense the incredible 500-year journey of a sculptural work by Leonardo da Vinci into a five-minute summary. A very lofty goal, to be sure, but what I do hope is the historical overview has at least sparked your interest to learn more about how a statuette, originally created from beeswax, over five centuries ago could have survived at all, let alone end up as a creation in bronze residing in Las Vegas, Nevada. My name's Jim Petty, and I'm fortunate, privileged, and honored to be a current caretaker of Leonardo da Vinci's horse and rider. I say caretaker because we believe that those of us involved with horse and rider today have an obligation and a duty to take care of the masterwork in this century and to share the existence of Leonardo's sculpture with the world. To that end, my wife, Anne, and I recently returned from Italy, where Leonardo has been revered as a favorite son, the favorite son, since the 15th century. Even today, Italian children are taught Leonardo's life story when they first attend elementary school. Leonardo's big. Other than a quick side trip to the Gucci factory outlet mall outside of Florence, <laughs> our trip was all business. It really was a rod. It was a business. Meetings had been set up with Leonardo scholars and museum curators, as well as PR and marketing firms. We visited several prestigious venues, exploring strategies and schedules to achieve our primary goal for horse ride and rider, which is to determine the best location and time to launch the world tour and exhibition of Da Vinci Horse and Rider. I'd like to share a few slides with you now, which highlight some of the people we met, some of the venues we inspected, and original Leonardo masterpieces we viewed. This first slide is, as you can see it right there, Da Vinci's birthplace, it's a couple miles outside of the town of Vinci in the Tuscany region. What a beautiful, beautiful area that is. His next couple of slides show the enormous popularity of Leonardo in, in, in Milan especially. Um, that was his hometown. And out of literally hundreds of Renaissance artists whose works you can see in scores of museums throughout Italy, only Leonardo is depicted in a larger-than-life sculpture in Milan's famous Piazza Duomo. Here's a collage of slides I took all over town announcing this way and that way to the next Leonardo exhibit. Every place in Milan and in Florence has the venue, museum, palace, whatever it is, will have something Leonardo. Very few have original Leonardos. Um, and that was one of my goals, to see all the original Leonardos in those two cities. Uh, I did pretty good. Let's see. And this was one of them. Uh, at the Covenant, Convent of Santa Maria del Grazia, where we viewed the world's second most famous artwork by Leonardo after Mona Lisa, The Last Supper. And, um, you know, this picture doesn't do it, uh, do it justice. The, the, the fresco itself is, is just huge. It's just huge, including all the, all the pictures you ever see are only this part, but it's got a roof on it. It's got a ceiling in the, in the building where it was painted and so forth. These next couple of slides, the Annunciation and then the uh, Baptism of Christ are on uh, permanent display in the Uffizi Museum in Florence. One of the, the Uffizi Museum holds the largest collection of Renaissance art in the, in the world. The portrait of a musician is an original in, in a, uh, the Biblioteca Ambrosiana in Milan. The next photos. This is a picture of Carlo Pedretti. You've heard Pedretti's name mentioned. In this picture, Pedretti is presenting Horse and Rider at the Renaissance Society of America's annual meeting in 2012. It was Dr. Pedretti who first introduced Da Vinci's Horse and Rider to Leonardo scholars worldwide in the 87 publication Leonardo da Vinci in the collection of Her Majesty the Queen at Windsor Castle that Rod mentioned. And when you visit Art Encounter Gallery, you can ask Rod to show you his rare could edition of the Queen's Book, as we call it, which has the first published black and white photos of horse and rider. Dr. Pedretti was graciously enough to invite Anne and myself to his home, Via di Castel Vitone, outside of Vinci, where, with the help of his assistant, Dr. Margarita Malani, is cataloging and compiling his life's work of Leonardo. Like Leonardo, Carlo Pedretti is a legend in his own time. 
He's been hailed as the foremost authority on all things Leonardo for over 70 years. This is a picture of a gentleman named Professor Ernesto Solari. Here on the, left -hand, the right hand side you see him in collaboration with uh, Padretti. And I was contacted by Professor Solari uh, earlier this year. Um, requesting information that I may be able to provide regarding his research on da Vinci Orson Ryder. And he added that he had discovered new details on the sculpture itself, which will further attribute the piece to Leonardo. In fact, he's going to publish a book later this year with his findings uh, dedicated exclusive to da Vinci Orson Ryder. That's really, really huge when it comes to the provenance uh, of the piece. Uh, Pedretti never put together a book on on the uh, history of the piece, and that's now going to be done. It, see, here I am. With, we had lunch with uh, uh, Professor Solari after a, a long meeting at his home in Lake Como. And you can see, that's not a painting. That's a picture of Lake Como there in the background. Uh, not a very good one, but uh, it's as good as I got here. Let's see, what do we got coming up here now? As I said, I visited several venues, had uh, meetings with curators and um, others that, uh, interested in putting on an exhibition. And it would appear that the uh, Palazzo del Stellini, pictured here, is scheduled to be the inaugural venue to launch the world tour of Leonardo da Vinci Horse and Rider exhibition. Uh, that's a really, really huge uh, deal and really honor uh, for us. And with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Rod. He's going to tell you a little more about how you can become a part of the Da Vinci Horse and Rider's journey into history. Oh. As part of our plan, oh yeah, there you go, perfect. These audio video guys, I'm telling you. Um, as part of our plan, we have done a limited edition of 398 reproductions or recasts of the original. What you're looking at in the center of this room is a recast. The original is plopped in a bank vault along with the mold. Uh, it's worth, <laughs> uh, probably by the time we're through, we're hoping $100 million. And uh, what we have right now is we're going to be doing uh, 299 bronze sculptures and 99 solid silver. We've sold quite a few. We've sold almost 100 now. And when we started out, and there's collectors in this room right now that purchased them back in the good old days. Uh, we started out in very nominally at 25,000 for the silver and I think 19,000 for the bronze was what our original prices were when we unveiled it. Currently the bronze is selling for $50,000 each and the solid silver is selling for $70,000 each. There's about 229 ounces of 0.999% uh, uh, silver, pure silver. And this evening, what you're going to get, and what I wanted to cover real quickly, you're going to get a brochure which basically, if you, if you want it, if you don't, that's fine, uh, that basically tells about the mold, it tells the history of the piece, and it, and it shows you what the silver looks like. We didn't bring one tonight, but, and then the bronze. The bronze is designed to look exactly like the wax did in 1985 when they made the mold of it. As you can see, it's missing the left front leg, the hands and feet of the rider are missing, the ears of the horse are missing, uh, simply because uh, beeswax was not designed to last 500 years. So when they did the mold and they made the original, and the original bronze was made, it basically preserved this for all time. Okay, so had we not done that or had the people in 1985 not done the mold, we wouldn't have it today. So we're blessed to have that. And then the other thing that we have that I want to talk to you about, which is really special, is we have been putting together some, I, I guess for back, back, lack of better words, an opportunity to own a Leonardo da Vinci. It doesn't happen, okay? Right now, we're part of a pretty exclusive club, which includes Queen Elizabeth II, Bill Gates, Okay, and a number, a number of other collectors who probably don't even want to be known. As a matter of fact, one person in Switzerland has a Leonardo da Vinci, and 
he's afraid to even bring it out because he's. I, I, our feeling is he's afraid that that Italy will come after him as one of the treasures that was removed prior to World War II. Uh, not the problem with this piece. We've that's all been checked out. So we have put together something that's really, really unique. And again, the mastermind, Jim Petty, came up with this. And it's really been a great idea. We've done very well with it. And we've got 10 sets left that we're offering. And But when I say sets, you can get a bronze, which is a $50,000 piece. And you can get a silver, which is a $70,000 piece, $120,000. You can get matching numbers. So if you're favorite number is 37, if, if it's available, and a lot of them aren't, 37 of the silver of 99, 37 of 299 of the bronze. We're making that, we're offering that up right now for only 10 pieces for $110,000. So not only do you save $10,000, but the caveat is this, we're giving up a half a percent ownership in the original. So you, you, for $110,000, you get two, two pieces plus $110,000. Now, I talked to the guys, I talked to the staff, and I said, how am I going to say this without it sounding really salesy, okay? Because uh, there's collectors here in this, the, in, in this room right now that have invested substantial monies in these pieces, and they're doing quite well, quite frankly. And, uh, but we wanted, we wanted to raise the balance of the money we owe on the piece, okay? We have a loan, the last loan that we want to pay, this will help us with that, okay? And so we have for a limited time, for $110,000, not only can you get two, a matching set of the bronze and the silver, but you can also get a ha bona fide, a half a percent ownership in the mold and in the original. It's outlined in this brochure. You don't have to, you know, look any further than that. Just take the brochure, and it tells you, and it's called the matching numbers offer. And uh, we've done well with that, as there's collectors in this room will attest, and that's why there's only 10 left to do that. Um, the other thing, it, it just basically in closing, what I want to say is that one of the things that my son has done tonight, which I think is pretty cool, as a as a, a token of his appreciation and of Art Encounters appreciation for you attending tonight, he has signed copies of his book. And if you have any friends that want one, that's available on Amazon, but that for each of you to take, and it's called the Pocket Picker for Fine Art. It's really basically designed for novice art people that when you go to a garage sale or an, an auction or a uh, an antique store or something like that, you're able, once you've read this book, you're able to determine whether something's really kind of good or not, okay? And there's humor in it, and I, I, I'm a big proponent of the book. I've read it a couple of times, and, it, and, and it's, it's really a lot of fun. So thank you, Brett, for making that available to everybody. <clears throat> and uh, with that, I think uh, we're going to close the, the, that part of the uh, this evening's uh, event, the dinner, and I think uh, they have a dessert bar and coffee and everything else like that after that. We will be available everywhere for if there's any questions. Uh, and uh, I'd just like to thank each of you for coming tonight. And I, I, hope it's, I hope you've learned something. I hope it's been a benefit. We've certainly enjoyed putting this on. Thank you very much. Here comes.